Because the new version of this seems to be, uh, if I disagree with what you say, I'll paint it as hate speech mm -hmm. or um, challenging to my notions of diversity mm -hmm. and inclusiveness, yes, right, sure. and I'll fight to the death your right to even have your say. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why hate speech laws are so pernicious. It's like, and that needs to be taken apart. First question, is there such a thing as hate speech? Yes, obviously. People say terrible things, reprehensible things, mm. quasi-criminal things even, all the time. Brutal, and some of them cause a lot of trouble. So the idea that there's hateful speech, it's like, yeah, okay, that's self-evident, no problem. Well, let's regulate it. Okay, fair enough, because it's hateful. You know, maybe we'd rather that there wasn't any of it. Okay, no problem. Who defines hate? Well, we'll worry about that later. It's like, no, you won't. That's actually the problem. Here's the answer to who defines hate. Those people that you would least want to have define it. That will be the inevitable consequence of the legislation. Because sensible people won't have anything to do with that. Like people who are power mad will gravitate to that domain to make an ethical case to exercise their controlling power over the language of other people. No, and I've had journalists say, well, what makes you think that your right to free speech trumps the right of someone to not be offended? And I think that's really the level of our political discourse. Okay, so we'll run a little thought experiment. So I'm talking to one person, I'm talking to you, and the rule is I don't get to offend you. Okay, maybe we can still have a discussion about something difficult. But let's say I'm talking to 10 people and, and about an important thing. Now I have to make sure that I don't say anything, despite the fact that this is an important and contentious issue, that I don't say anything that offends even one of those ten people. Okay, maybe I can even manage that. What if I'm talking to a thousand people? There's going to be someone in that thousand people, there's going to be someone who's offended at the mere fact that I exist. So, it's an impossible standard. It's like, well, you can't say anything offensive. Okay, fine, then you can't say anything. Okay. So what? You don't get to say anything because no one should be offended. Well, then you don't get to think. Well, what happens if you don't think? Well, then you can't negotiate your way through the future and you fall into a pit and so does everyone else. So that's where that all ends up. You can't say offensive things. Equals, you cannot negotiate your way properly through the future. Equals, everyone suffers. Well, that's a bad that's a bad strategy. So, and it's and it's all covered up with, well, you know, it would be better if no one was ever offended. It's like, well, who thinks that? You know how naive you have to be to think that? How you have to be pathologically naive, which is the kind of naive that you could have grown out of, but you willfully refused to because you weren't willing to see what was in front of your face. And then you impose that blind naivety on everyone else because you don't want to allow them to upset your like rosy view your rosy view of yourself and the world there's it's just there's no end to how terrible that is so one of our very astute writers recently made the comment that freedom of speech is the most important freedom because it's the freedom by which we defend all of our other freedoms it strikes me that freedom of speech, though, is most important not for the powerful or for the elites. Mm -hmm. It's actually for the minority groups. A mm -hmm. free society surely is one that allows those who swim against the tide and have a different perspective the right to do so without mm -hmm. fear of mob or state sanction. Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 You've had some personal experience. Sure. I, well, I gave a talk in, at the University of British Columbia about a year ago. It was called a left-wing case for freedom of speech. It's like it's really easy to make a left-wing case for freedom of speech. It's like, well, that's how I the dispossessed ha have the opportunity to make their suffering known, mm. right? Yeah, clearly. I mean, it's, it's the fact that that argument even has to be made shows you how pathological the radical left has become. because. It's clearly the case that freedom of speech is not generally in the interests of the power elite, right? Because they already have access to, to what they need to maintain their grip on the world, let's say, if you look at things yep. in that manner. It's the people at the bottom of the hierarchy yep. whose right to expression needs to be protected. Yeah. If you're in so, control of the debate, you don't need freedom of speech. Oh, right, right, obviously. 
So mm -hmm. it's always useful for the dispossessed, the freedom of speech mm -hmm. issue. And then the other issue that you wrote, that, that the writer that you described wrote, uh, uh, wrote brought to the forefront is the idea of the hierarchy of rights. Now, in our, in our conception of rights in Canada, we are not willing to assume that any right has priority over any other right. Now, that doesn't work out because when the two rights come into conflict with one another, which they do, you have to adjudicate their relative status. And what's happened in Canada is that equality rights keep trumping everything else. And that's not good. It's actually a good reason why you shouldn't have a bill of rights. And we never should have had one, in my estimation. But it, whatever. The freedom of speech, you say, well, speech is, the, the right to freedom of speech is central because it's the right by which you defend all the other rights. Well, that's why the idea of logos in the West is the most sacred concept, right? So Christ, is, think about this psychologically, is Christ is the, is the ideal of perfection. Now, this is independent of any religious discussion, or any historical accuracy. It doesn't matter. We're lo looking at this from the perspective of the analysis of a myth or a story. What Christ represents is the perfect individual, whatever that is. Now, you can discuss endlessly what that is, but one of the things the West has settled on is the idea, well, that, is that the perfect individual utters the truthful speech that makes potential into habitable order. Does that through truth? And that's embedded in the first few sentences in, in Genesis, for example, when, 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 when God brings the world into being. So, and, and the idea that that truthful speech that brings the world into being from formless potential also characterizes each person. That's our, 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 form, our fabrication in the image of God. That's the idea of the West. It's an unbelievably remarkable idea that perfection, individual perfection, is to be found in a relationship with spoken truth. God, that's, that's the great idea. Well, it's out of that arises the observation that there's no there's nothing more central to the hierarchy of, of rights and obligations as well, let's say, than freedom of speech. Yes, it's absolutely central. That's why Christ is the word made flesh. The idea is that the perfect individual is the person who's, well, who speaks truth, but also acts out the truth of those words. It's a very, it's a, it's a proposition whose merit is virtually self-evident when you understand it in that manner. So yeah, people, to, to see assaults on freedom of speech, especially compelled speech, well, that's where I drew the line in, in my life. It was like, perhaps that's we have why compelled the, speech legislation in Canada. Perhaps that's why the left is so determined in this country to get Christianity out of the classroom. But mm. um, tell us something of the chilling... There's no doubt that's why they're determined. Mm. I mean, people like Derrida, I mean, he called the West phallogocentric, right? Male-dominated, logocentric. It's like, that is the West. It's logocentric. If you want to take the West down, you remove the idea of the divine word from the substructure of the society. So you have to do that. It's like, and this is the level at which this war is being fought. It's fundamentally a theological war. Now, Interesting. People don't like to think that, but well. it is uh, famous uh, Waterloo uh, lectures, Blaise pa the inaugural Blaise Pascal lecture in 1978. Um, Malcolm Muggridge said the West was in danger of eating itself out from within. Mm -hmm. And he spoke uh, at great length about this attempt to, um, about how the, the West was abandoning Christianity mm -hmm. and it had become a very empty and soulless and financially bankrupt place as a result. But it wouldn't be the end, he said, despite the attempts to kill it in places like communist China mm -hmm. and Russia, there will always be people who will fight through to the truth. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can see now, three decades on, whatever, that he was absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Closer to four decades on, mm -hmm. he was right. Well, you know that Christianity is spreading faster in communist China than it did in Rome during its most rapid period of expansion, in terms mm. of proportion of people transforming. Mm. So Christianity is spreading incredibly mm. quickly mm. in China, which is, ex well, who would have guessed mm. that, right? I mean, that's, mm. that's, that just makes you, makes you shake mm. your head.